Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. May yahdihillahu falamudillala wa may yudlil falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh amma ba'du. Alhamdulillah. We first want to praise and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gathering us together for this event. It is definitely an honor to be invited back again to the Straight Path Conference. And I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one who has participated, who is participating, and who have helped to make this conference a success and a reality. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place all of this goodness on their scales of good deeds on the Day of Judgment. My dear respected brothers and sisters, indeed, the best of speech is the book of Allah, Al-Quran, and the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the most evil of matters are the innovations in the religion. Every innovation is a going astray, and anything which takes us astray will eventually lead us into Allah's punishment, into Allah's anger, and into Allah's fire, and we seek protection from that. I remind you, as I remind myself with the ayah, O you who believe, fear your Lord in the matters in which he should be feared. And do not die except in full and complete submission in Islam. For were you to be resurrected on the day of judgment, believing in a God other than Allah or along with Allah, were you to be resurrected on the day of judgment, believing in a prophet or messenger after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were you to be resurrected on a day about which there is no doubt, believing in a book of revelation after the Quran, then certainly you will be from among the losers on the day of judgment. And woe to those who lose on that day, for after it, they will never know victory. My dear respected brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, in the second chapter, in the 208th verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he be glorified, he says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم After seeking refuge in Allah, with Allah, from the shaytan, the accursed devil, Allah states, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أُدْخُلُوا فِي السِّلْمِ كَافَةً وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, O you who believe, Allah is speaking to me and you, inshallah, if we consider ourselves believers. Enter into Islam completely and do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. Indeed, the shaitan is an open, plain, and clear enemy to you. This ayah is the bedrock upon which I declare the following statement. No one is born upon Islam. I want you to think about that for a moment and think about what I am saying. That no one is born upon Islam. How so? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this ayah and commands us and encourages us to do what? To enter into Islam. So this tells us that Islam is something that each and every one of us must choose. Each and every one of us must choose to enter into the religion of Al-Islam. There are some who may be thinking to themselves, what about the hadith collected in Sahih Muslim on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu wa ardahu, may Allah be pleased with him, when he mentioned that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala fitrati. Each and every one of you is born upon the fitrah is born upon the fitrah. We say, yes, the hadith is authentic and the hadith is true. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah send his finest peace and blessings upon him, did not say, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-Islam. Every single child who is born is born upon Islam. No, the Prophet said, everyone is born upon the fitrah. So what is the difference? What is the difference between being born upon the fitrah and born upon Islam? The fitrah, my dear brothers and sisters, 
is defined as our natural constitution. It is our innate nature. It is that thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled in each and every one of us so that we can be able to recognize the truth from the falsehood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being as he created the jinn for one purpose and one purpose only. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ and I have not created mankind, nor the jinn, except for them to worship me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us for worship and not assist us in the process. From the way in which Allah assists us is that he structured us and allowed us to be born upon a fitra, a natural disposition and inclination to understand and to comprehend and to embrace and accept at tawheed the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are those whom I'm sure you have met, for certainly I have met them, who say to me, there are so many different religions, and I'm just confused. Every religion is the same. They're all preaching the same thing. There are so many different religious books. I just don't know which one is correct. This is the excuse of one that is not seeking guidance. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created upon, created us upon a natural fitrah, meaning that within us is the ability to recognize truth from falsehood, to recognize the light of Islam as compared to the darkness of every other faith and every other way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala May he be glorified. He has put that in us. And so I say that anyone who truly seeks out guidance, Allah will guide them. Anyone who truly takes time to examine their religion and to examine the teachings of Islam will find it to be true. Why? Because we have been born with an inclination towards Islam and with an inclination and understanding of Tawheed. My dear brothers and sisters, indeed, were you to see anyone in stress or in trouble, the first place where they look is up. Were you to see anyone in distress, the first thing that they do is cry out. Why are we so used to crying out? Because within us, we know that there is a Lord who is listening and inshallah who will respond to us. Why is it that we look up and we cry out in times of difficulty and hardship? Because we have been hardwired. Allah has created us upon a natural inclination to tawheed, to his being, to his oneness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms the statement of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran. In the 30th chapter of the Quran, in the 30th ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا and O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be upright upon the natural religion. The natural way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being. Upon the fitra. So my dear respected brothers and sisters, I want you to know that there are truly two types of people. Those who chose Islam from a state of kufr, meaning being raised as a non-Muslim, being raised as a non-Muslim, they have recognized the light of Islam and they have chosen Islam for their religion. The other group of people are those who, like me and you, were raised Muslims. We were raised Muslims, and yet and still there comes a time in our life where we too must choose to practice Islam. Is that not the case? Who can say that out of the 1.7 billion Muslims born, that everyone that is born Muslim is practicing Islam? This is not the case. And the reality is we see that this is not the case, especially today and in the times that we live in. How so? You find that 
our fathers and our grandfathers, they grew up in an Islamic society. They grew up with Islam as their religion and their culture and their practice. So they would go to the masjid and they would fast and they would attend the Eid and they would go along with what everyone else was going along with. And they were silent about their doubts. They were silent about those things that gave them trouble in the religion. But you find that the youth today, because of society, because of the way things are changing, because of the way that many Muslim countries are trying to imitate non-Muslim countries and practices and celebrations, you find that our youth have more courage to declare, I have doubts about Islam. I am not sure if Islam is the right way for me. And most importantly, you find the response that we give them is often the wrong response. We panic and we threaten them and we tell them and we command them to do the acts of worship instead of educating them, instead of bringing them to the different lectures, instead of participating in the circles of knowledge with them so that we may help to remove these doubts. My dear brothers and sisters, our youth, they are going through the same spectrum of emotions that we went through when we were younger. Alhamdulillah, we are here today. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding us. But never forget that there was a point in time in your life where you were lazy to perform the five daily salah. And you were lazy when it came to the month of Ramadan. And you were lazy when it came to opening up the mushaf. But something happened in your life. Maybe the passing of a relative, a father or a mother. Maybe a near-death experience. Maybe a lecture and words from someone of knowledge inspired you. Something gave you that desire to say, I will commit to Islam. I will practice Islam. I will enter into Islam completely as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to do in that ayah in Surah Baqarah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, udkhulu fi silmi kafatan. O you who believe, enter into Islam completely. So my dear brothers and sisters, the topic that was given to me is the faith and commitment of those who chose and those who didn't. I hope that everyone now understands that we all chose Islam. But there were those who chose Islam from a former state of disbelief and those who chose Islam being born and raised as Muslims. Either way, what is the difference between the two groups? For you find that those who chose Islam from a state of kufr and disbelief, you find that they are, for the most part, the people with the greatest drive with the greatest desire to spread the message of Islam compared to us who were born and raised as Muslims, you find for the most part laziness in us and not much drive and not much determination to spread the message of Islam. We find this to be the case. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about his companions, khayrun nas qarni, the best of people, is my generation. And the Prophet ﷺ was not speaking Arab superiority for his generation and his companions did not only constitute Arabs, but they were also made up of non-Arabs. You find from among his Sahaba, from among his companions was Salman al-Farisi, the Persian, was Suhaib al-Rumi, the Roman, was Bilal, and Najashi, and Anjasha, Africans, Sumayya, Africans. Yes, the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam constituted the entire world. They were made up of every single type of people, but they were still special. For Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Radiallahu Anhu, he mentioned that when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala looked at the hearts of all of the human beings, he found the most purest of heart to be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he chose him to be his final messenger. And then he looked at the hearts of the rest of the people and found the most purest of hearts to be 
the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he selected the most purest of hearts and made them companions to Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam. Certainly, these companions, their example is one that should be imitated and emulated. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about these companions? Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best people ever brought forth out of humanity. These are the companions. And what do we find? Over 99% of the companions chose Islam from a former state of kufr. But as for those who were born Muslims, they were few in number, such as Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu. What are the contributions of those who chose Islam from a state of kufr and disbelief? Those who came out of disbelief and came into Islam, what do we find from their faith and their commitment? We find these companions willing to sacrifice everything for their religion. They sacrifice their wealth. You find that they spent their money to buy those who were enslaved, their brothers and sisters to free them. They spent their money every time the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called them to spend. Either they gave half or less than half or more than half of their wealth. You find these companions, they sacrifice their bodies for this religion physically. We know that Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu used to be dragged through the hot sand during the daylight hours, during the zenith of the sun, and the stones would be placed on his chest, and yet he never wavered on his faith. We know that Khabbab ibn Arad radiallahu anhu, his master would take hot iron, put it in the fire, and then put it upon his flesh until it would stop sizzling. His entire back was covered with burn marks. We find these companions were willing to sacrifice all that they owned, such as Suhaib al-Romi, Suhaib the Roman, radiallahu anhu. Suhaib al-Romi, he came to Mecca poor. He came to Mecca without any wealth whatsoever. And while being in Mecca, he became rich from transaction, from business, from buying and selling. Suhaib al-Rumi, he was one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he accepted Islam. And when the believers migrated and made hijrah from Mecca to Medina, and the hijrah was the process of leaving Mecca and going to Medina, going where the Muslims were, going to be with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Suhaib al-Rumi wanted to follow and wanted to perform hijrah. When he took all of his belongings and he began to leave the city, he was stopped by the leaders of Quraysh. And they said to Suhaib, Ya Suhaib, you came to us poor and you became rich among us. Do you think that we will let you leave the city with all of this wealth? If you want to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you must leave all of your wealth behind, all of your possession behind, your home and everything in it, you must leave it behind for this faith that you claim that you believe in. So Haybar Rumi, he left it all and went to Medina, SubhanAllah, there he met Umar bin al-Khattab and the other companions and he told them what he had done. He told them that he tried to leave with his wealth and they prevented him. And so he left everything behind for la ilaha illallah. He left everything behind. And the companions, they said to Suhaib, what a profitable transaction. What a profitable transaction. It was worth every single penny. My dear brothers and sisters, from among the companions, you find those who not only sacrifice their wealth and sacrifice their health, but sacrifice their lives. And we know the first martyr in Islam to be that of a woman, Sumayya. Sumayya radiallahu anha gave up her life. All they were asking in return was a word. Give us one word of disbelief and you and your husband Yasir and your son Ammar, you all can be free. Just give us one word. And she refused to give that word. She refused to forsake her religion. 
She refused to abandon her faith and she paid the ultimate price. She gave up her life for Islam. You find from among these companions, those who entered into Islam from a state of kufr, that they strive to open up the world and to spread the message of la ilaha illallah. It is under the caliphate of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar bin al-Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum. May Allah be pleased with them. You find that it was under their leadership that the Quran was compiled and was distributed throughout the Ummah. We have this Mus'haf in front of us because of the sacrifice of these companions. And you find that this theme, this idea that those who come into the religion from a former state of kufr, they have so much faith, so much commitment, that has not changed from the time of the companions even today. Look at those who are making the most noise when it comes to sharing the message of Al-Islam. It is the revert community. It is those who are coming from a state of kufr who chose to practice Islam, making the loudest of noises in most cases. Look at our recent times. If I may say they are recent. In America, I'm in America. We know Islam. The Americans know Islam. White people know about Islam because of the sacrifice and the contributions of two. Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali the boxer. Why these two? These were two individuals who came into Islam, who chose Islam, although they were raised as disbelievers. But when they entered into it, their faith was a spark that exploded. And with every opportunity, they shared the message of Al-Islam, whether in the ring or outside of the ring. Look at the old interviews of Muhammad Ali, the boxer. Every time they were asking him questions about the fight, he would make a statement that Allah is great and that Allah is the greatest. Anytime Malcolm X would be asked political questions, he would always bring it back and remind the people that the solution to our problem, that the solution to racism is found in Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, I ask you, why is it the case that those who enter into Islam from a state of kufr have so much drive, have so much passion, have so much commitment for the religion compared to us who appear in most cases to be a bit lazy. There are many reasons for this, but there is one reason that I want to focus on because of the time. And this is the major reason why those who choose Islam after being raised as non-Muslims, why their commitment and their drive is so high is due to the fact that they know and understand and have experienced the darkness and the ignorance of kufr. Listen to what I'm saying. Those who chose Islam while being raised as non-Muslims they know and have experienced firsthand the darkness of kufr and disbelief and the ignorance of kufr and disbelief. Do you know what it is to be raised without guidance? Do you know what it is to wake up in the morning and not know what to say and not know that something should be said? To get dressed, to eat one's food and to drink without remembering Allah to go to work, to get on the train, to mingle, to marry, to have children, to bury one's relatives. How does one deal with stress? How does one deal with the problems of the world? Alhamdulillah, we have the Quran. Alhamdulillah, we have different dua. Alhamdulillah, we have istikhara. We have so much guidance. We have an abundance of guidance. But these people, they know what it is to be without guidance. They know what it is to experience a life with no guidance. And so when they come into Islam and when they choose Islam, you find that they have so much drive and so much motivation because of their experience. We find the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying something similar in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik 
radiyallahu anhu wa ardahu. He mentions that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are three traits, three things that if you possess them, then you have tasted halawatul iman, the sweetness of faith. Three things. If you have them, then you have tasted halawatul iman, the sweetness of faith. The first is that you love Allah and his messenger more than every and anything. More than your job, more than your spouse, more than your children. Allah and his messenger comes first, then one's parents, and then everything else will fall into place. The second is that you love your brother and your sister only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't love them because of business. You don't love them because the families are getting married and so you have this fake relationship. You don't love them and have a relationship with them because they are your neighbors so you're forced to be kind with them. No, you love your brother and your sister regardless of their nationality, regardless of their complexion, regardless of their accent, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their education, simply because they are a Muslim and you love them for Allah's sake. This is the second thing that if you possess it, then you are have among those who have tasted halawatul iman, the sweetness of faith. But what is the third? The third is directly connected to the topic. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the third is that you would hate to return to disbelief after Allah has guided you just as you would hate being thrown into the fire. You would hate returning to disbelief after Allah has guided you just as much as you would hate being thrown into fire. My dear brothers and sisters, I need you to ponder over this hadith. I need you to think with me. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our understanding and opens our minds. Look at the words that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used. He said that being thrown into the fire, who would, be cho who would choose to be thrown into the fire? Who would want to be thrown into the fire? No one. But those who enter into Islam from a state of kufr, they would hate to return to that darkness. They would hate to return to that ignorance just as much as they would hate to be thrown into the fire. So my dear brothers and sisters, indeed, one of the greatest motivational factors which push those who chose Islam after being raised as disbelievers, their greatest motivator is that they have experienced the darkness and the ignorance of jahiliyyah, of kufr, of disbelief. This is why they say that those who have experienced war are hesitant to go into war. Why? Because they have experienced it and they know the costs of war. But you find those who have never been into war, they are talking about it as if this is something easy. Why? Because they have never experienced it. Look, the month of Ramadan is fast approaching. The month of Ramadan is upon us. And were it not for the command to fast in the month of Ramadan, you and I, the majority of us, would never have the opportunity to taste the hunger. Yes, to taste the hunger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the month of Ramadan. And in it is a purification. In it is a blessing. But also from among the wisdoms of fasting in the month of Ramadan is that you and I have an opportunity to taste the hunger. Imagine we are trying to instill in our children compassion. And we are trying to tell them that they should work to feed the poor and to assist their brothers and sisters and those who do not have. How can they relate to hunger if they themselves have not experienced it? It would be extremely hard for them to relate. 
and for them to have this compassion. But in the month of Ramadan, when the stomach begins to grumble and you are looking at the clock and you still see three hours before we are able to break our fast, in that moment, you understand what it means to be hungry. And in that moment, you find that Muslims around the globe, we feed the most people during the month of Ramadan. Why? It is because of the experience of hunger, which is pushing us forward. Likewise, my dear brothers and sisters, the experience of being without guidance motivates and push them, those who chose Islam from a state of kufr, with such force and with such determination that they seem to be the leaders when it comes to calling the people to Islam and to the da'wah. But what does it mean for you and I? Are we not able to achieve such great lengths? Are we not able to have such high hopes and high faith? Are we not able to be as motivated? My dear brothers and sisters, I am not saying that there are not Muslims who were born Muslims who are working their butt off to spread la ilaha illallah. I am not saying that there are that there are Muslims who were born Muslims who are practicing Islam, born Muslims who are not as committed or who don't have the same drive as the others. But I am saying for the majority of us that we, the majority of us, we are lazy when it comes to working for the religion and to calling the people to Islam. We are lazy and we need to change our ways. But our laziness is due to what? It is due to the fact that we have an abundance of guidance before us. It is due to the fact that we have taken for granted the guidance and the Islam that has been preserved for us. As they say, you don't miss your water until the well it runs dry. We have an abundance of water. And so we think that it will never go away. And so we think that we have time to return to the obedience of Allah. Yes, I know Islam is good. And I will return to Allah's obedience after I get married, after I retire, after I raise my children, when I become older. We know Islam is the truth. We see the benefits and the blessings of Islam in the lives of those around us as well as our own lives. But unfortunately, it causes the majority of us to become lazy and not willing to work. Why? Because we have become spoiled. But my dear brothers and sisters, it is important that you and I recognize that we too can have the same drive and the same commitment and determination but it requires contemplation. It requires thoughtfulness. It requires reflection to reflect on ourselves, to reflect on the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved and has presented in front of us. My dear brothers and sisters, indeed, there are those who want to give da'wah. There are those who want to call the people to Islam. There are those who want to be just as active as they see other people doing. But there are two things which holds them back. And I believe these two are the main crutches which prevents those who chose Islam from a state of being born Muslim, being raised Muslim. Two reasons prevent us from excelling and reaching the high levels. The first is the idea that I am not qualified to call the people to Islam. How many times have you heard this? Have you said this yourself? I am not qualified. I am not an imam. I am not a sheikh. I can't call the people to Islam. I don't have any knowledge. I need to study. My dear brothers and sisters, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Relate from me, even if it is a single ayah. Relate from me. Remind the people about me. Share the message of Al-Islam. Share an ayah. Share a hadith. Stop telling yourself 
that you need to be a scholar to invite your neighbor to Islam. Stop telling yourself that you need to be a student of knowledge to invite your co-workers to Islam. Stop telling yourself that you need to have read so many books before you are able to invite your relatives to Islam. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has made all of us du'at. We are all callers to Islam. In that command, بَلِّغُ anni, Relate from me. The Messenger has appointed each and every one of us, young and old, educated and non-educated, to do what? To share what we know. So you do not need to have knowledge and you do not need to have studied to share the pillars of Islam, to share with your coworkers and relatives and friends and neighbors that we have come into the month of Ramadan and that we are fasting. You are not in need of knowledge to share this basic information. You do not need a degree from any college or university to share an ayah. You do not need it. But to teach Islam, then this is the job of our scholars. This is the job of our scholars to teach Islam. You need an education. You need to be a student of knowledge. You need to attend the lectures to teach. But to call, each and every one of us has the ability to call. So stop preventing yourself from being that active Muslim that you want to be. Because you are telling yourself you are not ready. My dear brothers and sisters, I am telling you, you are ready and you can do it. In the same way that our co-workers are not shy to tell us Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and to share their holidays and their events, we too should not be shy to mention our holidays and to mention our beliefs and to mention and to declare our faith. My dear brothers and sisters, when we look at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu wa ardahu, what do we know about Abu Bakr? We know that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was a close and intimate friend to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam before Islam. And we know, as the scholars have told us, that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the first free male to accept Islam. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the first free man to accept Islam. What did he do immediately after accepting Islam? Think about it for a moment. What did Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhum wa do immediately after accepting Islam? He went and he began to call his friends. What knowledge did Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu have at that moment? Where did he study? What did he have? In that moment after embracing Islam, all Abu Bakr as-Siddiq had was La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is all he had. The Quran that we have it in its complete form had not been revealed in its entirety. The ahkam and the rulings had not been revealed in its entirety. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him to Tawheed. And as I mentioned, he responded, why? Because each and every one of us were we given the opportunity to truly hear the message of Islam, we would recognize it to be the truth. Why? Because we have been born upon a fitrah, a natural disposition and inclination to Tawheed. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, he took this one word, this kalima, La ilaha illallah. Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he began to share it amongst his friends. My dear brothers and sisters, did you know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the famous hadith promised 10 companions paradise? I am sure you must have heard of al-ashara mubashireen, the 10 who were promised paradise. You have heard of them for sure. But did you know that five out of the 10, five of them, took their shahada at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. Five of them took their shahada at his hands. From among them, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Uthman ibn Affan, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Abu Ubaida ibn al-Jarrah, radiallahu anhum wa ardahum. May Allah be pleased with all of them. 
five out of the 10 promised paradise accepted Islam at the hands of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr was only equipped with La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Think about that. With La ilaha illallah, he brought five of the 10 who were promised paradise into Islam. So when you say to yourself, I don't have enough knowledge, remove the excuses. We have the knowledge. We know. We know Al-Fatiha. We know different ahadith. We know different things. We have been taught things throughout our entire life. We are fully equipped to call the people. And I am telling you that they are waiting for us to bring the message of Islam to them. They are waiting for us to just tell them and to remind them that they have a Lord and that Lord is Allah and that Lord is one. You have no idea how many people are waiting just to hear the shahada, leave your lips. But we must not be hesitant and we must not be shy in sharing that message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran, he, Allah, is the one who has sent his messenger with the religion of truth, which will supersede and surpass every other faith, every other religion. And Allah is enough of a witness for this. Meaning, Islam will become undoubtedly the dominant religion on the earth. Although our brothers and sisters in China, our Uyghur brothers and sisters, they are suffering great oppression. And our brothers and sisters, the Burmese the, for in Myanmar, they are suffering. The Rohingya, they are suffering great trials and tribulations. Muslims all over the world in Arabia and in the Middle East, they are suffering. Muslims throughout Africa are suffering yet and still, although it appears that we are at the bottom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that certainly Islam will become dominant and Islam will reign supreme. And look how Allah ends the ayah. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا Allah is enough of a witness for this. Meaning, that although in my lifetime, in your lifetime, you may not see the dominance of Islam. You may not live to see Islam spread and to become the dominant religion of the entire globe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hay, al hayyul qayyum. Allah is the living, the ever living, the one who sustains all. Allah does not die. Allah cannot die. And Allah will see this come to fruition. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كتب الله لأغربن أنا ورسلي And certainly Allah has already written victory for Allah and his messenger. My dear respected brothers and sisters, indeed, Islam will reign supreme. Islam will be a success. Do not allow Islam to succeed and you not play a part in that succession. Because whether you sit at home silently or whether you participate, Islam will still grow. Islam is the fastest growing religion on the planet. And Islam will continue to grow. And it will only increase in speed. So let us play a part. Let us empower ourselves. Let us share Islam. If you are not one to speak, then you can at least write on your Facebook pages and Instagram pages. You can share different ayat and share different hadith. If you are shy, then you can hand out pamphlets or you can volunteer in some da'wah organization. There is something that we can do to call the people to Islam. We do not have to sit back and watch our brothers, those who chose Islam from a state of kufr, who are being driven because they know the darkness of Islam. We do not have to allow them to be the ones to do the greatest and loudest of calls. No, we can be engaged too, but we must not cripple ourselves. We must not deceive ourselves in thinking that we are not ready or equipped. The second major excuse that Muslims use, those who were raised as Muslims, they use to prevent them from increasing in their faith and commitment and in their practice and in calling the people is that they say, 
I do not have time. When I retire, then I will learn how to read the Quran and I will start doing the good deeds and I will attend all of these conferences that I see happening. But uh, not now because I am too busy. Or maybe they say, I have young children. When my children become older, then I will begin to participate in the lectures and then I will attend the different halaqat with my brothers and sisters and I will go for lessons when, I, when my children become older. Or maybe they say, I am sick and I am ill and when I become healthy, then I will start doing da'wah. Or maybe they say, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enriches me, then I will start doing da'wah. Right now, I'm too poor and I'm too focused on my poverty and getting myself out of poverty. My dear brothers and sisters, do you know what this is? This is someone who is waiting for the perfect conditions before they go out and begin to practice and begin to call and begin to educate themselves. They are waiting for the perfect conditions to arrive. Let me remind you, there are no perfect conditions. There will never be perfect conditions. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to call the people to Islam, the conditions were not perfect. The Kaaba was surrounded by 360 idols. The people used to make tawaf naked. There used to be rampant prostitution. There was rampant gambling and alcoholism in the society. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, although he came from a family of affluence, a family of prestige, he himself was poor. He himself was an orphan. The conditions were not perfect, but that did not prevent Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commanding him, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'anvir. Oh, you who are covered up, stand up and warn the people. Allah commanded the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to stand up and to warn the people and to call the people to Islam, even though the conditions were not perfect. They will never be perfect, my dear brothers and sisters. If you are waiting for Allah to enrich you, you will never become satisfied with your wealth. If you are waiting to gain better health, then know that after you gain health, that it will be followed by sickness. If you are waiting for your children to get older, then know at that time some other responsibility will fall on your lap to keep you busy. If you are waiting to go into retirement, then know that at the age of retirement, you do not have the strength nor the energy to go to all of these places. You will become tired. As I told my wife today, so many people are waiting to retire, but the reality is they will retire and then become tired. <laughs> Subhanallah. They will retire only to become tired. We cannot wait on perfect conditions to begin to practice and to begin to call the people and to begin to show a level of commitment and dedication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from us. Look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is narrated on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa ardahu that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said In qamat ala ahadikum al qiyamatu that if the day of judgment reaches you al qiyamah if the day of judgment we're talking about yawm al qiyamah when the trumpet is blown in قامت على أحدكم القيامة If you are standing and the day of judgment has arrived وفي يده فسلة And in your hand is a seed In your hand is a small tree فسلة فليغرسها Plant it If you are standing on the day of judgment and you find in your hand a seed. You find in your hand a small plant. Plant that plant. Plant that seed. Plant that tree. I want to ask you guys a question. If a person is standing on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when the sun and the moon 
will be thrown into the fire of hell. And when the earth will be flattened, and when the seas will catch fire, and when everyone is standing, and when the angels are coming down, and when hellfire is brought near, and when paradise is brought near, in those conditions on that day, do you believe a seed that is planted on that day will grow? Ask yourselves, will a seed grow? Will a plant grow? Will a tree grow on that day? Will enough time pass and the conditions and it will rain and it will the soil will be nutrient? Would that seed grow? The answer is no. That seed will not grow. Not on the day of judgment. So why did the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam command us to plant that seed regardless? Because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that although the situation and the conditions is not perfect, if you have the ability to do some good, you should always attempt it. If the conditions are not perfect and you have the ability to do good, then you should do it regardless. And there is no greater example than the example that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave. That a person is standing on the Day of Judgment and he finds in his hand a seed and yet he says to himself, let me plant the seed. Perhaps some good may come from it. My dear brothers and sisters, this hadith is an example for us to realize that perfect conditions will never occur. But that instead, we should be focused on doing good when they present themselves. When the opportunity to do good opens and makes itself available for us, we should be engaged in that good. When an opportunity for us to attend a lecture opens, we should make time in our schedule to attend it. Maybe we will benefit from it. And even if we have heard everything before that the lecturer is speaking, then we should have hope and we should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels to go and to sit in the halaqat and the different lectures that are being taking place. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the angels, why are they there and what are they doing? The angels will say they are here remembering you, O Allah, and they are seeking your forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, bear witness that I have forgiven them. The angels will say, but there is so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. He or she had no intention of coming to the lecture. They just so happened to be present. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, and they too will receive my mercy. They have been forgiven. My dear brothers and sisters, what are we waiting for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to forgive us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to reward us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to bestow his bounty upon us. Let us stop being lazy. Let us stop making excuses. Let us stop waiting for the perfect conditions to occur before we become active. For indeed, none of us knows when the greater day of judgment will occur. And I am talking about that day when the trumpets will be blown and the books will be distributed. But there is another day of judgment. As the scholars, they tell us, the minor day of judgment. And what is the minor day of judgment? It is our death. None of us knows in what land we will die. None of us knows when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call us back. Look at this coronavirus pandemic that has plagued the entire world. In America, in the United States, over a half a million Americans died last year from the coronavirus. 500,000 people died from this virus. Were we to ask them before, how do you think you would die? None of them, none of them would say from a, a virus, a flu-like virus that would come and uh, cause respiratory failures and cause me to die. None of them would say that. They would probably think it would be more likely to be struck by lightning than to die from some new disease and new virus. But Allah has called them back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us life and has preserved us. And alhamdulillah, we have made it into the new year, into 2021. But the year is not over. And it does not mean because we have made it into the new year that the coronavirus will still not reach us and will still not affect us. We are not out of the woods just yet. 
We are not out of the woods. We should not think that we have survived coronavirus because of our immune system and because we drink our ginger teas in the morning and we have lemons and limes and citrus. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has preserved us. The only reason why you and I are here today is because Allah has decreed when and where we will die and our time has not come. But you and I do not know when that hour will be. So what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for wealth? Are we waiting to become less busy? Are we waiting to be more free? Are we waiting for more free time? You will find that the majority of people are sitting around waiting when there is so much good that could be done as it relates to calling the people to action. Let us not leave this lecture and think that because you yourself have not experienced the darkness and ignorance of kufr, that you cannot be as motivated as, the, as they are. Yes, you can. You can be just as motivated. But you have to want it. You have to desire it. You have to be willing to come out of your comfort zone. You have to be willing to keep your eye on the prize and say that I want the reward. Look at the hadith. The hadith said that it is better and more pleasing to me to have guided one person to Islam than to receive 100 red camels. And the red camel is extremely expensive. To be able to guide one person to Islam. And my dear brothers and sisters, you may also think to yourselves that uh, I, Subhan, I have been calling the people, but no one has, has really accepted Islam at my hands. I tell you that in most cases, the people who we influence the most will never truly tell us that we are the ones that inspired them. And it is only after our passing or it is only after much time has gone by that they come to recognize and to realize what you have given them. Maybe you are not a person who speaks, but you are a person of action. Know that your action is being seen. Know that your action is being recorded. Know that your coworkers and your colleagues and your classmates are being inspired by you when you walk with dignity and you walk in full confidence with your hijab. Know that your brother and your sister, your younger siblings and relatives are inspired by you when they see you dedicatedly sitting down and reading the Quran in the home. Know that you are doing a form of da'wah when you engage in all of your acts of worship on time. And when you make time on the job or whether in school to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of this is being seen. I remember myself, I work for a utility industry. I'm an engineer by trade. And I would pray in the corner in the locker room. There were some people who used to say hi to me who didn't say hi to me after they saw me praying. But there were others who came to me at the lunch break or who came to me at my workstation and said, I never knew all of this time that you were a Muslim. I'm so impressed by your confidence that you're willing to pray in front of everyone like this. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. They are inspired by me because I am carrying myself in such a manner. Likewise, my dear brothers and sisters, you also are in, an inspiration to those who are around you if you but knew, if you but understood. You, my dear brothers and sisters, must make time to read the Quran, must make time to nurture your heart, must make time to understand your role and your abilities so that you may be the best version of yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen does not ask of us to be anyone but to be the best that we can be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the most perfect and excellent example for us to emulate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا And certainly, in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the most excellent example. My dear brothers and sisters, the example is set before us. We have the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
We have the Quran and we have the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which has been preserved for us. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has promised to continue to preserve these sources for us until the last day. Let us take time to open these books. Let us take time to study these pages. And then let us not sit on knowledge, but let us act on it. I end with a few words from one of the great scholars, Ibn Hazm and Andalusi, the great scholar of Spain. He mentions in his book, Mudawatun Nufus Wal Akhlaq Wa Siyar, a book, alhamdulillah, that I translated in the English language. The Shaykh, he says that indeed the person who is stingy with his knowledge is worse than the person who is stingy with his wealth. How so? Because the person who is stingy with his wealth, he has a right to be stingy. If he gives, he will have less. But the one who is stingy with his knowledge, if he gives his knowledge, he does not suffer a decrease. The knowledge that we have, my dear brothers and sisters, if we give it out, we are not going to lose it. Instead, we are not only benefiting ourselves, but benefiting every single individual that is around us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among people of action. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sincerity in our words and in our deeds. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.